Okay, so in the last video, we had calculated the cross product of our two partials. Now, I had miscopied something, so I inserted a note into that video, but I want to make sure that you caught it. This first component here should be negative a squared sine squared b cosine theta. I had inadvertently written a sine theta here. So there should have been a little thing that popped up in the video in the last video to point that out, but I want to make sure that if you didn't catch that, that you corrected that. So that's a cosine of theta there. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to take the magnitude of this. So we're going to have the magnitude of del r del theta crossed with del r del phi, and that's going to equal the square root of something very, very long. Okay. Excellent. But what's going to happen is we're going to be able to simplify it, and it's going to get much, much shorter and much, much simpler. So it's going to be really, really realistic to integrate this. All right. So I need to square this. So I'm just going to square each factor. So I'm going to get a to the fourth sine to the fourth phi cosine squared theta plus a to the fourth sine to the fourth phi sine squared theta plus a to the fourth, sine squared phi, cosine squared phi. Now, if I look at these first two terms, they both contain a to the fourth, sine to the fourth phi. And that's being multiplied by cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. But I know that that's just one. So these two terms collapse down to the square root of a to the fourth times sine to the fourth phi. And then this is plus a to the fourth sine squared phi cosine squared phi. So now I can factor something out of those two terms because both of them contain not only an a to the fourth, but also at least two factors of sine phi. So I can factor out a to the fourth times sine squared phi. What's left here would be the other two factors of sine phi. And what's left here is cosine squared phi. And oh my goodness, that's just one. So we've got the square root of a to the fourth times sine squared phi which is going to be a squared times the absolute value of sine phi. a squared, I think it's obvious enough that that can't be negative. That, I mean, technically I suppose I could put the absolute value of a squared there, but that's always going to be bigger than zero. Okay. So I can simplify that part to just a squared. Now, as a general rule, sine of something can be positive or negative. But if you remember, when we wrote down our parameterization, part of that parameterization involved listing the restricted domain that we were working with. And we said we were going to have phi only taking on values between 0 and pi, because that's all it does in spherical coordinates. And so sine of phi will be bigger than or equal to 0 over that interval. So I can simplify that to a squared sine phi. Now, if you look at that, that should probably look familiar. Because remember, rho was constant at a. So that actually is just rho squared sine phi, which is usually the scaling factor that I get when I switch to spherical coordinates. That's not quite what we're doing here. We're parametrizing in terms of two of the spherical coordinates, which happen to be the two that show up in that scaling factor, usually we get a row and a phi, okay? Uh, so that is the result that we get, okay? You can't just memorize that and use that. You can expect that on at least one of, if not both, the third exam and the final, you are going to have to parameterize the sphere. And you are going to have to work out the magnitude of the cross product of the two partials. You can know that what you're going to get is whatever that radius was fixed at squared times sine of phi. And if you don't get that, you can go back and check your work. 
But I'm not giving you credit for memorizing that because I believe everybody could memorize that and then I believe everybody could forget it two weeks into summer. Some of you could forget it sooner than that. I could certainly forget it sooner than that. Okay, so I do want to see the work in working it out, but it is nice to see that connection. Not safe to assume that, however, because here we were using spherical coordinates and we were holding rho constant. If I used spherical coordinates and I held phi constant or theta constant, I wouldn't get the equivalent of rho squared sine phi. So I do need to be careful about that. Okay. Okay, but what we got was a squared sine phi. So now I know that we're just integrating over d a squared sine phi dA. And d, remember, was this rectangle in the theta phi plane where theta went from 0 to 2 pi and phi went from 0 to pi. And again, we aren't switching to spherical coordinates. These are rectangular coordinates in my parameter plane, and we've been working in those coordinates from the beginning. We aren't switching to them. So there's no scaling factor as I adjust. So I'm just going to say this is the integral from 0 to, I guess it doesn't matter, 0 to 2 pi, 0 to pi, a squared sine phi, d phi, d theta. And of course, since these are constant limits of integration, doesn't make any difference which one I do first, as long as these go with my d phi and these limits go with my d theta. Okay, the a squared is constant, so I'm going to just factor that out. Integral from 0 to 2 pi. An antiderivative of sine phi would be negative cosine phi, and that's going to be evaluated between pi and 0. And then we'll finish up with integrating d theta. Okay. So, that's going to be a squared times the integral from 0 to 2 pi. Cosine of pi would be negative 1. The opposite of that, so it's the opposite of negative 1, which of course is going to become 1. Minus the opposite of cosine of 0, which is 1, and then d theta. So, this just becomes 1 plus 1, so that becomes 2. So, we've got a squared integral from 0 to 2 pi of 2 d theta. Of course, if we're integrating a constant, we're going to get a squared times that constant times the length of this interval, which is just 2 pi. We're going to get 4 pi a squared. I'm very glad that that's positive. I'm even gladder that that's the correct formula for the surface area of a sphere. <laughs> now, I'm just going to show you something neat that some of you might already be familiar with and some of you might not be. If I have a sphere, the volume of a sphere is just 4 thirds pi times the radius cubed. The surface area of a sphere is just 4 pi r squared. We just proved that. We were just calling the radius of the sphere a. Okay. If I took the derivative of this with respect to r, I'd get that. That's not actually coincidence. But why it works, we're going to sort of be suggesting it by the end of this chapter, but not full on proving it. But it's a really nice thing to remember. That way, if you remember the formula for the volume of a sphere, you pretty much get the formula for the surface area free. Or if you remember this one, you could take an antiderivative and get this one. So you only have to know one of them plus that kind of nifty, tri we'll just think of it as a trivia fact. It is mathematically significant that that happens but it's beyond the scope of the course to prove that that goes beyond coincidence that will strongly be suggested by what we cover in future sections.